Hey everyone, my name is Max Seberg. I'm here from Monarch Capital speaking about um, different ways of funding and financing your game today. It's a pleasure actually to, to be speaking at this event. It's the first time for me to attempt and speak here and um, I think the setup sounds fantastic. So let's get started on it. Um, yeah different ways of financing and funding um, your game is, is today's topic. What I would like to do today is to walk you through the fundamentals of different ways to achieve different ways of funding and, 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 and compare them a little bit, right? Um, before we just dive and step into this, uh, maybe just a quick introduction. As I said earlier, my name is Max. I have been working in the gaming and financing industry for a few years now. Um, I originally have a background in investment banking, um, so quite traditional financing, I would rather say. Um, I have been then working in venture capital and have built with different funds um, various media and um, game related companies. Um, the last one is a game media related company that now has four offices worldwide. Um, but um, more recently, we've launched one of Capital, a um, well, predominantly user acquisition focused fund that is aiming to help games that once they've launched to you know, increase their user base and, and, and scale their activities up. Right. Um, today, what I would like to do is, um, and since we only have those 30 minutes um, in that kind of setup, is to compare only four quite prominent um, examples of, of financing someone's game. Um, there's a lot more out there, obviously, such as like, you know, other smaller methods that have been used like Kickstarter and so on. I'm not going to speak about all of them today, just, to, you know, to keep it a bit more um, focused. So today we're going to focus on venture capital, on banks itself. So when we talk about banks, we mostly speak about loans, and credits, um, quite related to that. The third one, I would like to mention credit cards. Um, and as a last one, um, a more recent example of a way of how to fund then the growth later on is, is, is user acquisition. Now, the first thing that you probably noticed now is to say, hey, Max, what about publishers, right? We, we in the gaming industry, it's a little bit different when you want to build something. The, the one that you go most often to probably is, is the publisher. Now, let's take a step back before we can decide what we believe is the right way to fund and financing our game, um, it's quite important to get the mindset right, right? Do I wa rather wanna be the developer that focuses on developing a certain game or do I rather wanna be the entrepreneur that builds up a studio? And I think this is a very essential question before thinking about what kind of different ways of financing and funding are out there. The reason for that being is that when you decide to go with most publishers that in the, well, I'd say in the classic historical sense, um, they take away a lot of responsibility from you in the sense that they would take care of finances, of marketing, they even would help with certain game creative aspects and so on, let you really focus on the development part. Right. So this is a more hands off experience almost while when you are going to a venture capital fund or a family office, you are being put really in the driver's seat here and you have a far more um, hands on experience, which you have to navigate. Well, most often by yourself. So bottom line here is mindset. What is it that I am looking for? And, and, and how do I want to build out that game? Shall that game be a part of my development success or shall that game be part of a studio that I'm looking to build? Now, today I'm more focusing towards anyone who's thinking about building out their own studio, not just giving away, you know, the IP or the, 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 the rights of that game to, to, to a um, publisher to become a little bit more hands off, but actually to say, I, I want to look for for different ways of, of, of financing. Now, um, let's start with venture capital here. Venture capital is probably the most, um, you know, 
um, developing um, one in the most more recent times. There have been more and more venture capital funds plopping up that are now focusing specifically on gaming. That can be gaming tech, that can be uh, mobile gaming, hyper casual gaming, that can also be like computer based or PC or console based titles. But we've seen this um, across the board in both, you know, um, Asian and in European and North American countries that there's more and more, um, yeah, VCs for, 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 for specific gaming coming up. There's also non-gaming venture capital funds that are more and more going into a direction of looking into that space. So the timing is probably right when you say, all right, why not going down that hill? Right? Now, the advantage of going with a venture capital fund is always you gain two things. First of all, you gain money, right? Um, which is why why we're having that conversation or the dialogue, uh, the, the, that speech here today. But the other point is what, what it will give you is obviously a lot of experience and network, right? So what you're hoping to get out of it is maybe to finish your development and also have money to build out your studio, to hire people, to run marketing and so on. But essentially, those people are extremely experienced in a field that can help you to grow your network, to find the right people to join you, or to maybe like, you know, know a certain kind of like, um, or no, no certain kind of other companies that they've been working with that made mistakes that you can now avoid, right? So there's a lot of advantages in that field. Now, when it comes to venture capital and family offices, we need to kind of like a bit differentiate what this actually looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. Venture capital can be much more hands-on, which means Friday evening KPI calls, really making sure that any you know metrics you're driving, especially when it comes to like you know hyper games or hyper casual games, can be quite stressful. Um, you know any KPIs you're driving have to work. They they actually vested in your business now, right? So so they want to make sure that all of this is tight and works. So prepare yourselves for very hands-on people in most cases with a traditional venture capital fund that um, will give you advice when needed, but they also expect, you know, a certain amount of, um, you know, walkthrough when it comes to certain numbers and so on. Um, so, so there's a bit of, you know, someone sitting on your board table from now on, right? You're not the only one who's making decisions. Um, and that has both, you know, it's just something to think about. Now with family offices, it's a similar procedure. You give away equity, right? This is the opportunity cost, essentially giving away equity for cash, um, which doesn't really change when it comes to any um, family offices in, in most continental European countries. However, they're a little bit more hands off. Right. So when you think about, you know, your angel investor, your family office, they might be able to like, you know, help you without, you know, telling you too much what to do and how to do it. So it depends a little bit maybe on the experience, the guidance and so on that you need. At the end of the day, and this is, I guess, what this talk today is all about, is your mindset and the opportunity cost that follows with it. Right. What's the lesser evil? Yeah. And, and, and if you can tell for yourself, well, it's all right to like, you know, give away equity and, and you know, to, to have someone else sitting on my board. Um, and for that, I gain experience, then maybe venture capital or even a family office is the right route to go down here for you. Right. It's just something to, I would say, consider um, in what kind of stage you're also in. Right. Um, when you have an idea, a draft of a game, you haven't really started to produce anything yet. You haven't really any, done any game design that might be too early staged. Um, maybe they expect you to have already like, you know, done a game, you're doing your second game. Are they investing in actually a game or into the studio that you're building yourself? So you always have to ask yourself, um, is it just a game that I'm building or is it a company that I'm building? And that is a that's the major difference, right? Um, a game is a game. A game um, is, can, can be seasonal. It, it, it has its momentum, which to be fair, a company also can have. But what I'm trying to say here is that when you raise money just particular for only game, it's a very different procedure than what if you do the same thing for a company, okay? I've been asked like, in, in another call, like, you know, how this this might actually differ you know when you like raise money for for a game versus raising money for for a company um the kpis are the first thing that you know differ considerably yeah one thing might be something where you look into retention rates into daily active users and so on 
versus yeah this is really profitability right so um it's just something to keep in mind when you prepare yourself for that case um last but not least when it comes to venture capital what to add here is the topic of um pitching for it um and and, and how to pitch it well the thing is every vc is different and is looking out for different um well trades and, and, and different kinds of aspect how they want um, yourself to be how they want you to be to present yourself so it's hard to like you know make a general assessment here but nowadays what we've seen quite a lot is the shorter the better right to make really sure that you're focusing on on, on the core elements no one need, wants to i mean think about it like this you know you're a partner of a venture capital fund you sit on multi millions of dollars and it's like you know and, and you have to read through pitch decks you don't want those pitch decks to be 30 pages long no one has time for that right so they're not going to like look through all of those single pages so my recommendation to just wrap the venture capital family office part up here is probably to keep it short and snappy right um in the sense that you not just go on a more visual approach which clearly is the right thing in gaming and makes a lot of sense to like you know demonstrate what you visually can do but more importantly is to show that you know your numbers know your numbers is the advice that i would like to give you all right guys um so that's kind of like sums it up with bc Bottom line is um, opportunity cost is the equity you give away for um, set, set money that you raise, but that is quite common knowledge. So keep rather in mind that you also have a board seat that needs to be filled in most cases that someone like might, you know, argue with you about certain creatives or certain like, you know, direction the game or the company should head towards to. So you're not alone in this anymore, which also gives you again an advantage if you want to bring someone else on board with a little bit more experience. Now, you could do this, but you could also go to a very, I think, the most classic route there is that, you know, probably every business owner in the last like 2000 years um, looked down to, and that is going to a bank, All right? Why not? Um, when you think about like a lot of like European programs that are out there that are, you know, helping to, to fund game development, we've seen this in Germany, we've seen this in other uh, Northern European countries, then there are programs that offer loan injections, which then are supported by, for example, a house bank, right? So it's probably worth to check out if there's any programs like this lying around, but then again, in the most classical route there is, we should also think and look about, um, you know, the classic loan agreement or the classic um, credit that the bank can give out. Now, the advantage here obviously is that, you know, you're still relatively independent. No one is going to tell you if your logo should be green or black or if your character needs a different skin or a different weapon to hold. That's not for the bank to say right the bank um is look at your figures if you do have any p l from the last years if there's any um credit worthiness behind it and and they're gonna just make a decision which is pretty much black and white right so it's something that you can always give it try and see see if it works out but um i mean the the problem occurs much much more early on you're not selling i don't know um fruit and tomatoes and vegetables on on your little store that you want to raise money for um you're doing something that is a bit more um modern right and and that's that's gaming we we made the experience that the banks or like banks we wanted to collaborate at the beginning with which we didn't add, add, uh, end up with collaborations with is that we went to them and said hey guys do you want to um help us we want to finance um games and they looked at us and said gambling we're not going to do gambling with you so no 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 it's not gambling it's gaming it's a completely different thing and and look well, my point is they didn't even get the difference between gambling and gambling gambling has certain regulatory issues that in the european union and other um, regions they need to follow i get that but like you know the 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 woman at the tiller or like you know behind her desk that has been like opening bank accounts for the last like 50 years or 20 years she for, for her might it might not really be a difference if you go there and say look i have this like you know a hyper casual casual game in mind and, and it's maybe coin based or it's like you know utilizing other ways of financing monetization 
she will look at you and not get one thing. If you then go ahead and say, look, but my core data is amazing and I have fantastic day, uh, daily active users who are spending a lot of money on all the app stores and look at my apps via data and so on and click through rates are off the roof and the CPI is below 50 cent. She will still look at you and say, what the hell is going on, right? So, so what I'm trying to say is in a lot of countries nowadays, banks still haven't grasped the phenomenal growth that gaming has made in the last decade or two decades, right? They, they're still behind that. I'm not saying this is everywhere, but unfortunately, so I'm sitting here in Hamburg, so I have a German hat on um, in, in a way, and, and this is an experience we, we really still see today in Germany. I've spoken to colleagues and to developers in countries like Scandinavia and in, in, in other regions where they said that banks love what they do and and they really just are on the lookout for games so my bottom line recommendation is give this a serious try because there are countries which are really in the favor of gaming and do understand what the difference between gambling and gaming is but then again there's others where this is simply not something that they are aware of just yet right um now what you give up obviously is a part of your earnings in the sense that you have to pay them back but you also obviously have to like consider interest now where this becomes a huge disadvantage is when something that you've built is seasonal or not facing momentum anymore because a bank always requires you to pay back the same amortization and the same interest rates on a monthly basis it's very, very rare that this is basically linked to your actual revenues. Now, what happens is if your revenues go down, for example, your game is buggy, it gets rejected or it has a bad review, people don't like it, whatever, something that all of a sudden happened and really like brings down revenues per half, then that's a serious issue because you obviously are linked to strict amortization and strict um, interest rates. Now. Um, this is just something to consider and it's probably worth considering depending on the stage of business that you're in. If your business is something that just needs a small cash injection, maybe friends and family is a better way of handling that where you can actually talk with them if business is not going that well rather than the bank that might just close shop and put you into insolvency, right? Um, so so just, just keeping that in mind that We've seen like you know larger lines of credit making sense for more established businesses that, for example, do have you know multiple years of P&L um, and, and and other proof of of their own um, I would not just say concept but like you know of of their financial stability in that sense. Yeah. A little bit linked to that, but differently is obviously credit cards. Credit cards, and now we're getting more into the topic of like. All right, I have a game ready. I need I need a little bit more time, and I want to utilize that more. Can obviously be credit cards. Now this is obviously something that you can utilize. Yeah, you can obviously make sure that um you can extend the 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 period of paying something back. But you need to be extremely careful here, obviously as well, because at the end of the day, um, credit cards, same as any credit from a bank that comes, um is is checking your um. Yeah, your 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 own standing, right? So this can like you know not just like affect the company, but you also personally, right? It it, it can have the advantage of, of obviously giving you flexibility, which I don't, which I completely agree on, but um, just keeping in mind that this is not just thing, just something that affects the company, but it can do personally. When you think about all the procedures you have to go through, right? So this is KYC processes, AML processes, and so on and so on, that might be related to it, yeah? especially in the segment of gaming. Um, now, the last and the part that I wanted to squeeze in here most definitely is user acquisition funding and user acquisition financing. Now. Some of you might heard of that term before and it's not completely relatively new, but for those who haven't heard about it, I would like to start from scratch here just explaining a little bit its concept and its principles because obviously 1UP Capital um, and the firm that I'm representing today is offering this, um, so I'm trying not to be too biased here in terms of the decision of different ways of financing and funding you can make, but I wanted to put it out there because it's something that is 
been there for like maybe two or three years now and it's definitely growing there's a few more players in the market including us now and i think this makes it an exciting and a very electric environment now to be in now when you think about user acquisition funding it's pretty much you know related to the terms that 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 that, that it is right so we have a product here that wants to finance your acquisition of users by financing your marketing activities the problem that we see and i'm now focusing entirely on like you know um, a mobile centric game is you are putting fifty thousand euros into your game today right you're acquiring new users in some cases those users are you know paying something directly they're monetizing directly through ads they're monetizing through in-app purchases but maybe this also takes a certain amount of time until they're monetizing could up take you to up to three months um, um, until you finally see that 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 user who's always playing free is is is, is um, spending something now let's say it takes a month or three months it still doesn't get paid out on the day where the user decides to finally put this credit card through yeah it gets then accumulated until the end of the month those earnings right so the first problem is when you look at it from a timeline perspective, you invested $10,000 today to acquire new users. Those users finally arrive, but then again, it takes them up to three months to somehow commit to it and monetize. Now, once they're monetized, again, it takes until the end of the month, until Google, Apple, Iron Source, any ad network, Facebook, they're accumulating that money and telling you, great, three months later, at the end of that month, you've made $14,000. You're obviously happy because you made $4,000 more than what you've put in, but that comes three to four months later. So a lot of momentum gets lost here. That's to what I'm trying to say, right? Instead of having that money so much further down the line, you want that money immediately paid out and reinvested. Because once you see that you know there can be positive ROI on your game, or once you see that this can actually be scaled, and this is the essence of it, it needs to be able to be scaled, then the whole thing can actually make sense and skyrocket your game. Right. So this obviously is a product not for people that are for apps and developers that have just um, you know thought about like building a game and who are still in development. Um, it's always something to consider, but it's more for someone who is now starting with revenues and trying to scale this up. Now, what we essentially do as a user acquisition fund or what user acquisition funding essentially does is it pays out those future earnings in advance. Right. So we are using a way of making sure that whatever values you're telling us, let's say that you're going to have 14,000 in, in that many months um, can, can somehow be tracked or proven, yeah? And when that is the case, then we can give out that sort of credit line or we can factor those future um, receivables, right? We can finance those future receivables. And that's exactly what, what, one, what one of capital or user acquisition funding is aiming to do. Um, paying out future receivables in advance. Now, how does it help you? Well, if you think about it as a timeline, right? Like if you always have the money that you're gonna earn in three months already today, you can reinvest it and grow on a much quicker rate. So what it does essentially is it's accelerating your growth. You don't have to wait three months until the next growth period comes comes in. That next growth period comes in immediately, right? And and that's that's the key thing here. It's all about acceleration. You want to grow when you hit momentum. When when your game was featured in in, in the app store. When your game was um, featured by a prominent influencer. Or when simply you hit user acquisition so hard on the head that it finally performs well you want to throw everything at it that you can possibly can give right and and that's what we're here for we don't look at like how long does your company exist you know like we get it like it doesn't make sense we're not a bank um you, you don't have to show us like 10 years of credit card statements and 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 always performing well with everything it's not possible yeah but we need to make sure that you know what we believe future revenues could look like are actually going to work out so because this is just a recorded session unfortunately um i i i'm not able to you know take any live questions on this but um i'm sure there's contact details where you can contact us to ask questions about any 
of these different methods of funding and financing a game, not just user acquisition, financing and funding, of course, but anything. If you have a question about that in particular, if you please feel free to reach out. More than happy to answer any questions that are related to that as well. Now, just taking the last like you know minute or two to recap a little bit on all of this. You really should always keep in mind what you want to build a game or a company. What is the mindset? Uh, what is your mindset looking like? Do you want to be the entrepreneur that looks at finances, runs the company, hires people, really has the hat on and, and, and has complete control, well, almost control about almost everything? Or is it something that you want to build that is really just the, as a creative masterpiece, your game, and, and that's where you where you where your where your core skills are lying in and then that's what you want to focus on and it's not wrong to admitting that you don't want to do finances and you don't want to do marketing you just want to build a good game well in that case maybe the publisher route is the right route right maybe that is making much more sense for you but if you decide to go down the more entrepreneurial route then all of a sudden you just have so many different choices of financing it right you can go to venture capital but should venture capital be the right route is it maybe a family office at the beginning or an angel investor how much share should i give him what is my opportunity cost looking like and what do i get in return and not just money right so keep in mind take away for venture capital family offices you give away equity you give away a board seat you give away a lot of nerves <laughs> but you also gain a lot of other things besides money from it in terms of learnings experiences exposure to certain markets whatnot check out what those are make sure that you understand those right banks give you the independency on the other hand creatively board wise you know strategic decision wise but they obviously tie you down to a monthly repayment that is completely tied to an interest that well if the interest is low obviously like it stays the same for a while now with the rate of inflation we are in but um if, if you can lock that down on a good level for you good for you but if you have an uncertainty in your business if it's you know if, if you can't if you have seasonal fluctuation or anything like this you need to be extremely careful yeah um now with user acquisition financing and this is like maybe something i should have mentioned earlier there also is a cost related to it i mean i said i'm biased but i'm not trying to be too biased here there is obviously a cost model behind it like somehow a user acquisition fund has to also make their money but it's a fee-based model right so it works very differently um from like you know an interest from a bank it's a percentage fee that is being taken off so i would buy your receivable off so let's say you make ten thousand euros in three months i would give you nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine for it today right but i would get the ten thousand in three months so i would buy that receivable off from you for a discounted price and that discounted price equals my fee yeah um so so that's like you know the, the the main difference here um and i think a fee model is always a little bit more well flexible than than an interest rate model is nowadays but um just to keep that in mind guys i i closing down now on my last um you know minute um i i hope this was helpful i hope this gave you a little bit of a glimpse into like the different ways of financing again with an unknown audience it's always difficult to say how broad or how specific or how narrow you should go how much knowledge is there previously um, i mean i'm not going to explain how um, you know credit the credit models work this is not a, a econ 101 or finance 101 session here for university students this is just a um, trying to make it as close to real life examples as possible i hope this helped you all a little bit um, feel free to reach out if you do have any questions about any of that um, more than happy to discuss it further and um, yeah there's a lot more ways to do it um, this is just a few of them so keep your eyes open and um, decide what's best for you based on the mindset that you want to go in the long term i guess that's going to make you the happiest Guys, all the best of luck. It was really nice to talk here today and have a fantastic event. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.